So we are very happy to have Alex from Magil. And he will tell us about the gravity from averaging CFT. Please start. Good. Uh, so um, it's a pleasure as always to be back at Berkeley. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the chance to, to speak today. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be talking uh, primarily um, about a paper uh, that came out last week in, in collaboration with Edward Witten. Um, I should also uh, mention another paper that came out on the same day by uh, Akkam Ujeti, uh, Cohn, Hartman, and Tajdini, um, which uh, had a slightly different perspective, but considered um, sort of largely similar sets of ideas. Um, I'll also mention in passing various other, uh, other uh, pieces of work, um, although my primary focus will be on these papers that came out last week. Uh, in particular, I will also mention as an aside, a paper that came out, um, you know, perhaps two months ago with Nathan Benjamin uh, and Scott Collier, um, although I won't focus on that. Uh, if you're more interested in that paper, uh, my understanding is that Scott is currently giving a seminar on it uh, at UCLA. Um, so you could always switch over to that one uh, if you like. Um, I think uh, this is what's referred to as flooding the zone in, in sports. I'm not actually sure which sport, um, uh, hockey, I assume. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Also, um, maybe just as a way of uh, uh, beginning, uh, you know, I think we're all still getting used to this whole Zoom seminar thing. Uh, so let me encourage all of you to please interrupt and ask questions. You know, typically when I give a talk, uh, you know, my only way of making sure that I'm pitching it at the right level is uh, based on feedback uh, from the audience. So um, I really do encourage all of you to um, uh, interrupt me to ask questions uh, if something is unclear. Um, I think my pen is working, uh, so I can even write down uh, some explanations there uh, uh, if, if that's helpful. Um, good. And also, I invite all of you to turn on your cameras. Um, uh, that way, based on the, the stunned expressions on your faces, I can uh, understand whether my, my explanations are uh, hitting home or not. Good. So let me um, go ahead and get started. Um, really, uh, uh, before diving into any details, I'd like to begin um, with a general overview of the sorts of questions um, that I'll be interested in today. Um, so the basic question uh, that I'd like to try and understand is whether there's a sense in which gravitational theories, quantum gravity, um, emerges uh, from an averaging of quantum theories. Um, this is an idea that has been sort of percolating in the literature over the last few years. Um, and maybe before we get into any details, let me just comment that when I say averaging of quantum theories, there are really two uh, distinct yet related things that we could be talking about. Uh, we could either be talking about gravity emerging when we average over many configurations of the same theory, uh, or we could be talking about gravity emerging when we ensemble average over many different quantum theories. Um, now, the first of these, I think, is somewhat more traditional and in a sense is rather well established. Uh, so, for example, when we think about black holes, a typical black hole microstate is a very complicated configuration, which presumably does not have a nice geometric description in terms of the low energy variables of general relativity. Um, but if we were to average over many of these microstates by coarse graining over many states uh, with the same or nearly the same energy, then we would expect that there is a gravitational description that emerges. In particular, there is a just geometric description in terms of a black hole geometry. Okay. But today, the sort of averaging that I want to discuss is the second type of averaging, where we ensemble average over many different theories. But even before we begin, uh, we could anticipate that this first type of averaging would imply that there's a sense in which this second type of averaging would hold as well. In particular, if you have a, a so-called self-averaging theory, uh, then that means that the average over many configurations of the same theory should, in some sense, be related to an ensemble average over many different theories. So already, just based on kind of traditional black hole ology, 
Uh, we might anticipate that there is a sense in which gravity can emerge uh, from some sort of averaging procedure. However, this idea has been made uh, much more precise in the last uh, couple of years, in particular, um, really based on uh, remarkable work by Saad, Schenker, and Stanford um, in the last year or two, uh, this picture has emerged where a two-dimensional theory of gravity, known as Chakiv Teitelboim gravity, is equivalent to a theory of random Hamiltonians, a theory of random uh, matrices. And so the question that we would like to ask is whether this is a mere quirk of an extremely simple theory of gravity, a theory of gravity in two dimensions, or whether this is a general lesson that might apply to other uh, more complicated theories of gravity. So an intermediate step in that direction would be an understanding of gravity not in two space-time dimensions, but in three space-time dimensions. Of course, this is still simpler than the full glory of four-dimensional gravity or string theory or something like that, um, but it is um, a sort of richer environment than the 2D theories of gravity that have been studied previously. And in fact, um, there are already some hints that perhaps three-dimensional gravity in anti de Sitter space is some sort of theory that emerges uh, when one averages over many different quantum theories. Uh, for example, um, let me just mention one piece of evidence. Yes, was there a question? Uh, yeah, just a quick question before you go into this. Uh, the first type of averaging that you mentioned, where you just average over states in the same theory, um, I, I was actually, well, I want to understand if you really meant that you believe that if I had a single pure state in a theory that that could not be dual to say a black hole geometry? I mean, I think that presumably uh, at low energy in terms of some sort of coarse grained observables, it would resemble very closely a black hole geometry, but I wouldn't describe it, you know, for example, in terms of the Schwarzschild geometry precisely. I mean, uh, in the same sense that if I studied the air molecules in this room, um, you know, they're described in terms of coarse grained thermodynamic variables very well, but that is not a precise microscopic description of the air molecules in this room. But I'm not trying not, to say anything more fancy than that. Sorry, but yeah, but that's not something everybody agrees on yet, right? It's, you say simple and it's, it's not clear. I mean, uh, any okay. pure state black hole you may have interior and so on, it's possible, right? Okay, my, so, my, goal, my, my okay, um, this is an interesting discussion. Uh, but unless you seriously want this to be a two hour long talk, um, maybe, I agree. Yes. Uh, maybe I can defer that unless there is a particular, uh, Raphael looks unhappy, but maybe that's just, what, just, 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 just what your face looks like. Okay. Now you look delighted. Okay, great. <laughs> but, okay. Um, so as I mentioned, there is already some circumstantial evidence that perhaps three-dimensional gravity in anti de Sitter space should be thought of as an averaged theory rather than as equivalent to a single quantum mechanical theory. So for example, you could imagine uh, computing the partition function of the theory. So here I've written one simple example of the partition function, which is the thermal partition function at some inverse temperature beta. That's the trace of e to the minus beta h. And then uh, several years ago, um, you know, I and, and other people uh, gave some attempted calculations of such partition functions uh, in terms of a quantum gravity path integral, where one starts with a sum over classical saddle points that I've called G naught here, uh, weighted by a classical action, and then we have a one loop action, and then we have various higher loop corrections, at least in principle. And you can go ahead and compute this quantum gravity path integral, and you can ask whether it takes the form of a trace over a Hilbert space in some nice quantum mechanical theory. And the answer is no. And so this was originally pointed out in a paper uh, I wrote with Witten in 2007. Uh, it does not take the form of a trace over a Hilbert space. Um, namely, there are two very important problems with the answer that you get. Uh, first, the spectrum that you would get if you tried to so interpret it is continuous. And second, uh, the spectrum is negative. 
So they're pieces that are, are negative. And in fact, there was a recent um, paper last summer uh, by Nathan Benjamin and collaborators uh, who pointed out that there were much more serious negativities appearing in this partition function. However, it turns out that um, with certain assumptions, uh, these negativities can be cured. And uh, there is a candidate spectrum for uh, quantum gravity in three-dimensional anti-de Sitter space that is purely positive, but it is still continuous. And so uh, if the spectrum were negative, then there were no way, there would be no way that could, it could arise as an averaging over many different quantum theories because the average of a bunch of positive numbers can negative, never be negative. But because there is now a spectrum that is continuous and positive, one can plausibly interpret it as arising from some sort of averaging procedure. And in this case, uh, the continuous density of states would emerge because, not because uh, you know, the theory is sick in any uh, significant way, but merely because one can average uh, many different discrete spectra and obtain a continuous spectrum. So for example, uh, if one looks at a random uh, Hermitian matrix or a random matrix in some ensemble, although each individual element of that ensemble has a, a discrete spectrum, when one performs that average, uh, one gets a continuous density of states. And here I've drawn sort of a cartoon uh, of what such a positive but continuous density of states might look like in a three-dimensional theory of gravity. And for more details on this, I recommend that you uh, switch channels and go look at Scott's talk that he's giving at UCLA right now. But here I've just uh, drawn one sort of cartoon for what such a continuous density of states might look like. So this makes it plausible that this density of states, that uh, quantum gravity in three-dimensional anti-de Sitter space might arise as an ensemble average over some ensemble. The question then is what sort of average and what sort of ensemble? So let's begin to try and uh, answer that question by developing a theory of random conformal field theories. Usually in ADS CFT, we think of gravity in anti de Sitter space as dual to an individual CFT. But this new perspective is that we should think of gravity in anti-de Sitter space as instead dual to an average over an ensemble of many CFTs. That is to say, a random CFT that is drawn from some particular ensemble. So let's begin then by thinking about how we might define a random conformal field theory. So we should start by listing the data that you need in order to define a conformal field theory. So in the case of JT gravity, which was dual to a random Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian is, is defined by its spectrum. And so in that case, what one really needed to think of was uh, a distribution on the space of spectra of Hamiltonians. In the present case, we're talking about conformal field theories. And the data that defines a conformal field theory is a list of operator dimensions and spins. Or in the gravity language, we would say this is a a uh, list of energies and angular momenta for the various states in the theory, as well as a list of three-point coupling coefficients, a list of operator product expansion coefficients. So these are the pieces of data that uniquely define a conformal field theory in two dimensions. And what we'd like to do is think about an ensemble of conformal field theories where we average over this data. Now, in order to do this, however, uh, it turns out there are a lot of uh, other questions that need to be answered first. So first of all, the constraints of unitarity and conformal symmetry place uh, many different uh, constraints on the allowed values of these data. Okay. So uh, for example, the conformal bootstrap program is essentially the program where one tries to determine the complete set of constraints of consistency and unitarity on the set of data. Okay. So before even beginning to develop a theory of random CFTs, it appears that one must first solve the conformal bootstrap problem. 
in order to understand the possible allowed values of this data. Then, having solved that, you need to decide on a probability distribution over this set of allowed values. So some probability distribution on the space of dimensions, spins, and OPE coefficients. And then you need to compute an average. And you need to compare it to your expectations of a gravitational theory. So uh, this, however, seems to be a very hard problem. So instead, what I will do is the usual thing that one does when confronted with an extremely difficult problem, which is that you start by considering the simplest possible example. And the simplest example that one could imagine studying in order to compute such an average over a space of CFTs is the space of free conformal field theories, or what I will call nearly free conformal field theories. Because as, uh, as we could discuss, uh, there is a sense in which these theories are almost free, but not quite free. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just study uh, free scalar fields. Okay, so conformal field theories corresponding to uh, D free scalar fields, uh, where D here is an integer. And because I want a conformal field theory with a discrete spectrum, I will take D compact scalar fields. Namely, the scalars will all live in some compact torus. Okay? This is a d-dimensional torus, which is the target space of these d scalar fields. Then, as we will discover, or as we will review really, because it was discovered by Narain, there is a moduli space of such conformal field theories um, that I'll call the Narain moduli space. And there is a natural metric on this moduli space, which defines a measure. And then we can compute the average of any observable that we wish over this moduli space. So in particular, the computation that I'll describe today is one where we compute the generic conformal field theory observable. That is to say, the partition function of the conformal field theory on an arbitrary Riemann surface that I've called sigma here. And I will average it over this moduli space, the Narain moduli space of conformal field theories. And then I will try and interpret the result in terms of three-dimensional gravity. And in particular, what we will discover is that the result looks a lot like the sort of result you would expect from a theory of three-dimensional gravity. In particular, it takes the form of a sum over saddle points, which we can naturally associate to geometries. So it takes the form of a sum over geometries or a sum over topologies, weighted by a classical action, along with a one loop correction. And uh, in principle, there would also be an infinite set of subleading corrections. However, what we're going to discover is that with some assumptions that we'll describe, we can actually just enumerate all of the saddle points that appear and compute all of the loop corrections that appear. In particular, what we'll discover is that this theory is, in a sense, one loop exact. So the loop corrections are relatively easy to compute. And so having computed all of the saddle points and loop corrections in this exotic theory of gravity, we can then compare with the expression that we get when we average over moduli space and find exact agreement. Now, I should emphasize that the perspective that I'll be taking in this talk today really might be the reverse of the perspective that one usually takes when one studies, say, the quantization of gravity, where Rather than starting with a theory of gravity and then trying to quantize it by, for example, studying quantum corrections and enumerating all of the possible uh, geometries that would appear in a sum over geometries in quantum gravity, instead, I'm going to take the opposite point of view, where I start on the conformal field theory side, I average over the space of conformal field theories, and then from that, I infer what my theory of gravity looks like. And as we'll discover, 
Um, it is, in some sense, a rather exotic theory of gravity. Uh, it does not, at low energies, look like um, Einstein gravity in anti de Sitter space, but it is very similar. The sorts of saddle points that appear have a natural geometric interpretation, uh, and in many ways, it has a lot of the flavor of uh, a theory of quantum gravity, much like the ones uh, that we are more familiar with. But it is definitely a question. rather exotic theory. Yes, please. Uh, do you do you fix the uh, dimensionality of the base manifold? Like these are two-dimensional CFTs, three-dimensional, or, or two-dimensional two conformal field theories? Thank you. So <laughs> here, um, these are two-dimensional conformal field theories. Yes, okay, I should. You. I'm using. I, I sort of am reserving capital D for uh, the number of scalar fields. Um, so these are two little d. CFTs dual to some 3D theory of gravity. Good. So that's my plan for the day. Um, maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions. You know, any technical questions on how this proceeds, I'll defer until later on in the talk. Um, but um, if there are any general questions about philosophy or strategy, please, uh, please feel free. Uh, Sorry. So the, no, there is no bootstrap problem, right? Because we know more or less everything about this. Exactly. Yes, there's no, yes. I, I, I mean, for a general space of conformal field theories, one would of course start by solving the bootstrap problem. That would be step zero in this program. Instead, I'm going to start with a space of conformal field theories where the bootstrap problem has been solved, as I'll review momentarily. Uh, Alex? Yes. So suppose the real world was described by an ensemble of theories that you have to average over and each is unitary. In that case, the real world would not be unitary. Is that correct or am I misreading this? Um, well, uh, the average of, you know, um, the, there would be some echoes of the constraints of unitarity on the real world. Uh, yeah. It would not be described by I mean, specifically it would be possible for uh, well, to the extent that it's possible to, to make sense of the notion of the same quantum state in all these different theories, uh, that state would be evolved to different states over time. In these and this, this exotic theory of gravity is not, in a sense, a quantum theory. It's an yeah. average of many quantum theory. And those are just two different things. Right. I'm just curious whether you think that that is, well, if you ask is this a warm-up to the real quantum gravity theory, or are we considering the possibility of information loss? You know, if you ask me what I secretly believe, um, I secretly, if you, okay, believe is too strong a word. I suspect that the correct theory of nature is actually an individual quantum theory, not an ensemble of many, many quantum theories. You know, but very often there's almost no difference between the two. Um, so, um, you know, in a chaotic theory, um, it's very hard to tell the difference between um, an individual theory with very complicated coupling constants uh, and an average over many different theories. Um, and very often the average theory is vastly easier to study than any individual element of the ensemble. So if you ask me what I secretly believe, I think that would probably be a Okay, I see that you're muted, which means I probably- Alex, uh, one okay. more question. Um, so I understand that it's very natural to average over a class of CFTs if one gets wants to get ADS3 gravity, but is it entirely obvious that we have to average over a class of CFTs? Is it not possible that we average over a more general class of Hamiltonians, but still get uh, ADS3 gravity? It's certainly possible. I'm just sort of following what I think is the uh, path of least resistance, but many things are possible. Thank you. Fair enough. Good. Okay. All right. So here's my plan for today. First, I'm going to compute an average. Then I'm going to give it a gravitational interpretation. Then I'm gonna end uh, with a little bit of speculations and uh, conclusions. So let's begin by thinking about how we might average over a space of conformal field theories. So just as a warm-up problem, uh, let's consider a single free boson. 
So I'll call this, uh, this is a scalar field uh, that I've called X and it lives on a circle of radius R. And I've written here the standard action for a free scalar field of radius R. So this is a conformal field theory with central charge one, and it has a U1 times U1 current algebra, which reflects the fact that this theory is translationally invariant, where I can take X left and X right and translate them and you get the same theory back. And the parameter R is the modulus of our space of conformal field theories. And it is this parameter that we are going to average over. So in order to understand how to average over this parameter, we need to understand what the correct measure is on this space of conformal field theories labeled by the parameter R. In order to do that, we note that there is a marginal operator in this field, in this theory, which is the operator that I have written here. And this is the operator that generates a deformation of this radius r. If we were to insert this operator in the, uh, if we were to exponentiate it and insert it in the path integral, all it would do is effectively change this radius. So that allows us to define a natural metric known as the Zamolodzikov metric on this space of conformal field theories. And its two-point function determines that metric. And I've written it here. The metric is dr squared over r squared. And then when I say that I'm going to average over this space of conformal field theories, I mean averaging with, this, with respect to this metric on moduli space. So in particular, when I write a symbol like this, which where the uh, left and right angular brackets denote an average, I mean an average with respect to uh, this measure on moduli space. There's one more comment that I need to make before proceeding, which is that, as you probably know, in fact, uh, this radial parameter R is slightly overdetermined. It slightly overcounts the number of conformal field theories because two-dimensional conformal field theories are invariant under a t-duality symmetry that takes R to one over R. So in particular, you can check that that t-duality symmetry R to one over R is an isometry of the metric. So in particular, it leaves the, the measure on moduli space unchanged. So when I talk about averaging over R, I really only want to average over distinct conformal field theories. So I integrate R from one to infinity rather, rather than from zero to infinity. Good. So that's our space of conformal field theories. That's how we're going to average over them. We now just need to choose some sort of observable that we want to average. Um, and actually, can I ask a quick question here? Please. So um, I thought two slides ago you were, you were averaging over, uh, is, is D fixed or is capital D also a varied parameter? D is the number of bosons, which is one on this slide. Okay. But later you will for free bosons. Uh, on the next slide, uh, there's going to be a disaster, uh, which means I'll need to take d bigger than one. Oh, but you are uh, you are considering a single d at a time for. I'm considering the... a single d at a time. Okay. Although we could talk about averaging over d at some point if you wish. All right. Thanks. Alex. Yes. Are we uh, going to consider only quantities for which the integral that defines the average converges, or do you normalize by putting some cutoff on large I mean, R and dividing all, by the log? All will be revealed. All will be <laughs> revealed. You. Okay. Uh, that's but a good question. I have a question too. Uh, is this related to Fadev, that Zenko uh, way of getting minimal models out of the compact divide boson? Or no? Not as far as I understand, but I'd be super interested uh, to, yeah. Okay. Not as far as I understand, um, okay. but that's not very far. Okay, so, okay, good. Okay, so having defined a measure on the space of CFTs, let's decide what observable we want to compute. Now, uh, the simplest observable that I could imagine computing is the spectrum of the theory which is encoded in the torus partition function. 
So here I'm studying the theory on a torus with modular parameter tau, and I'm computing the torus partition function here. And uh, that's a, it's, a, it's a theory of a free boson. So it's completely straightforward to compute the torus partition function that encodes the spectrum. And it's written as a product of two terms. So first of all, we have a one loop determinant. So because it's a free theory, uh, the, the, the expression for the partition function is simply equal to a sum over classical saddle points times a one loop determinant, because that's all you get in a free theory. So we can then just go ahead and compute it exactly. So the first term that I've written here is what I've called uh, theta, um, because it's, it's a kind of theta function uh, that we, one might call a siegel narine theta function. Um, it's a sum over uh, classical solutions. Those classical solutions are labeled by two integers, commonly referred to as the momentum and winding, because if we were considering a world sheet string theory, uh, that's what they would be, the momentum and winding numbers of a string. And what I've written here in the argument of the theta function is just the exponential of the classical action of uh, such a solution. And then we have a one loop determinant, which one can actually compute exactly here, which is a prefactor for that. And the first thing you notice is that in fact, uh, life is not so bad because this one loop determinant uh, is independent of the modulus R. So when one wants to compute an average over moduli space, all you need to worry about is this theta function. Okay. Unfortunately, however, if you were to actually try and integrate this theta function over R using the measure that I described on the previous slide, you would find a divergence. That's very easy to see. First of all, uh, the first thing to note is that, uh, as Raphael probably anticipated with his question, um, the integral over R, uh, just the volume of moduli space, uh, so the integral of one dr over R diverges, okay? And if you were to insert this theta function in that average, that doesn't improve the situation. In fact, it only makes it worse. So this uh, program seems to have completely failed. So I'll just end my talk here. Actually, uh, okay, that was a joke, but you know, when you're giving a virtual talk, you don't get much feedback from the audience. So I'm gonna assume that joke went over extremely well. Um, in any case, um, let's try and consider a, a more interesting situation where the sum converges. So rather than considering a single free boson, let's consider a slightly more interesting situation where I have D free bosons, where D is some integer. Again, I'll call my fields X. I'll label them with a parameter P that runs from one up to D. And then one can write down the most general possible uh, conformal field theory uh, for D free bosons. And they're described by a set of coupling constants that I have called G and B. Of course, the world sheet interpretation, uh, we think of these as a metric and a B field uh, in target space. This conformal field theory that I have written down is the most general conformal field theory with a U1 to the D times U1 to the D current algebra and central charge C equal to D. So what we now want to do is average over the space of such conformal field theories. The moduli space of such conformal field theories is what we usually refer to as the Narain moduli space. It's the set of G's and B's. And the set of G's and B's can be thought of as parametrizing a point in SOD comma D. But in fact, um, this SOD comma D uh, overdetermines a point in moduli space. So in fact, this moduli space is better regarded as a symmetric space that is given by a quotient. So we quotient by the right action of, or the left action of SOD times SOD. So that defines for me 
a metric and a B field. But then we have the analog of the T-duality symmetries, which are given by this discrete group, SODD, uh, valued in the integers. Okay? That's the generalization of the T-duality that takes R to 1 over R. So this moduli space, as we have written it down here, um, is a symmetric space. Okay? It's a homogeneous symmetric space because it's given in terms of a coset. That defines a invariant metric on this space. And that metric is the same metric that you would get if you computed the two-point function of a marginal operator that moves you around in moduli space. In the same way that for the free boson, we computed a metric on moduli space by considering the two-point function of the uh, marginal operator that changes the radius, you can derive a metric on this moduli space uh, by computing an analogous two-point function of the moduli in the theory. And I've written the metric down here. Um, its, its form is not uh, particularly uh, important here, just to emphasize that it is relatively simple. And that reflects the fact that this is a highly symmetric space. And we can then go ahead and average over the space of conformal field theories. And we can average with this measure. Okay. So in particular, when I write a angular bracket here, I'm going to average with a measure. And that measure is going to be the volume element with respect to this metric on the space of conformal field theories. Good. Unlike the single free boson that we described earlier, uh, once D is bigger than one, the volume of moduli space is actually finite. And that as you increase d, uh, these integrals get more and more convergent. And this is something that we'll encounter again later on in the talk. This, might, this is sort of reminiscent of the fact that as you increase the dimension, uh, if you look at a volume of a sphere in d dimensions uh, at sufficiently large d, uh, the volume decreases rapidly. And it's a similar sort of phenomenon that's going on. So when I talk about an average over a space of conformal field theories in this talk, this is precisely the average that I'm talking about. So I would uh, just like to say it's not just a symmetric space, but also an arithmetic uh, uh, yes. symmetric space because you're quotienting out by an uh, arithmetic group with the AP. Uh, but I just want to understand uh, the geometry of this space better and mm -hmm. some very basic or the first basic invariant, what is the dimension for D? Uh, for a given d of this space? Oh, geez, I don't remember. So it's d times d plus 1 over 2 plus d times d minus 1 over 2. d squared. Because g is symmetric and b is anti-symmetric. I see. And the metric it's is uh, Taylor? It's a... Um, um, it is the homogeneous... It, it, so it's in, by the Kidding form or...? Yeah, so uh, you could write down the left invariant um, one form associated with this construction as a homogeneous space uh, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, construct the metric from there. And you would get this answer that I've written down. I see. Uh, the B field somehow comes out of that, okay. The B field is important. Yeah, the B field has an important role to play. Good. Great, any other questions? Yeah, so uh, eventually, I guess you would like to show that there's some self-averaging property of uh, random. I, I, I am just, so self-averaging is something that we would be interested in if we were studying a chaotic theory. And self-averaging is a property that you would appeal to if you wanted a single instance in an ensemble to reflect the behavior of the ensemble as a whole. Here, I'm going to be much more boneheaded and just compute an average over an ensemble. Um, okay, yeah, I guess from the introduction, I thought that maybe you were headed in this direction of like, there's a, if you pick a single uh, member of the ensemble, it's close to just the average version, but I guess for this talk, we're just no, sticking with the- That's propaganda. No, that's just propaganda. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Great. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe I can uh, ask the same, qu the same question differently. Besides calculating the average, can you potentially calculate the standard deviation of some Absolutely. quantities? Absolutely. 
and show that it goes to zero? Absolutely. So later on in this talk, I'll discuss how to compute standard deviations and all of this stuff. So I assume that's the answer to Vincent's question then. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. So I've defined what I mean by averaging. So now what is the quantity that I want to average? So let's talk about the partition function again. So now we have D free bosons rather than a single free boson. But the partition function that computes the spectrum, so the torus partition function, in fact, uh, takes a very similar form. So it's given by a one loop determinant. In fact, the exact same one loop determinant that we wrote down earlier, just now to the dth power because I have d free bosons. So that's the easy part of this calculation because that thing is independent of the moduli. In the same way that the one loop determinant that we wrote down earlier for a single free boson is independent of the compactification radius. In d dimensions, this one loop determinant is independent of the moduli of our uh, conformal field theory. The only thing that depends on the moduli is the sum over classical solutions, which again, I've denoted by a theta function. And I'm not gonna write it down for you because it's a little bit complicated, but it's really not that much more complicated than the theta function that we wrote down earlier. But the important point is that the integral of this quantity over moduli space now converges. All one has to do is integrate this theta function over the moduli space of conformal field theories. And it's given by what in the number theory community is known as a Siegel-Weil formula. Um, it appears in a variety of different contexts uh, in number theory. It appears in the classification of lattices. Um, it appears in the theory of rational of, of quadratic forms. Um, uh, and in the present case, um, it's appearing because our construction of a uh, free conformal field theory um, is very close to um, uh, the construction of lattices in um, number theory or in um, uh, you know, the theory of uh, sphere packings or something like that. So not to be pedantic, it's a uh, whale, Andre whale. Uh, not while. Okay, thank you. People would think that very easy. But, uh, so, uh, but the last point or the more important point, and you just uh, hit upon that, uh, can one think of MD as the moduli space of uh, some lattices with some additional structure maybe? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very closely related. Yeah, I mean, it's the moduli space that we wrote down on the previous slide. Well, over there, you just said it, the moduli space of conformal uh, field theories. It's no, you're the moduli space of the double self dual Lorentzian lattices of that That's signature. Right. Yeah. Pardon me? Can it, you, it, you wouldn't want to think about it as a moduli space of Euclidean lattices, but you could think about it as a moduli space of Lorentzian lattices. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so, and just the last thing. So, the what is the transformation behavior of the Eisenstein series here? It's a. Uh, let me let me get to that. So the way I, I've incorporated, so I've written it so that it's modular invariant. Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, people pull out the factor of m tau, so it's not modular, so that it transforms like a modular form with some right. under modular. Right. Transform. The way to Eisenstein. Okay. Let's. let's, let's so let me uh, let me let me get to that. Good. So um, the formula that you get at the end of the day when one computes this average. Um, is that the average value of the torus partition function is given by this one loop determinant factor, but the theta function has been replaced by an Eisenstein series. And I don't wanna to dwell too much on the form of this Eisenstein series, except to say that um, it is expressed as a sum. And in fact, it's a sum basically over SL2Z. So it's the sum over the modular group um, of two by two integer matrices. And of course, that's not an accident because we're considering a torus partition function of a conformal field theory. So you shouldn't be surprised um, that uh, the answer for whatever it is you wanna compute is written in terms of modular invariant functions. So there are a variety of ways of writing these Eisenstein series. By the way, I should distinguish that these are not the Eisenstein series that uh, people most commonly encounter uh, in number theory or in the theory of modular forms. 
which are holomorphic functions of tau. Uh, these are what people usually call real analytic Eisenstein series okay. um, because there's an absolute value that's appearing in the denominator here. Of Kronecker Eisenstein series as well. He, he used them a lot. They, they go on under various different various different names. But they're very yes. Good. Okay, so this is the answer that we get, um, and uh, it turns out that there's actually a, a rather simple derivation. Uh, I think, in the interests of time, I won't dwell on that derivation too much. Uh, the point is basically that the theta function that we're studying obeys a very simple differential equation where if you act simultaneously with the Laplacian on the upper half plane, so this is the Laplacian that parametrizes the moduli space of the Riemann surface that the CFT lives on, and you simultaneously act with a Laplacian that parametrizes the moduli space of your conformal field theory, uh, these combine together to give you just a number when acting on the partition function. At first sight, um, it seems rather ridiculous that such a thing is true. But if you think about it, there's an intuitive explanation for why such a formula should hold. Namely, the, the taking a derivative of your partition function with respect to the moduli pulls down factors of the U1 currents that generate the change in the modulus. Whereas changing the uh, modulus of the torus that your CFT lives on uh, means inserting factors of the stress tensor. But we're studying um, uh, theories where you have a U1 current algebra and the Vera Zorro algebra is, it sits inside that U1 current algebra. In particular, the stress tensor of the theory is given by the Sugawara formula, which means that the stress tensor is related to the U1 currents. And that, I think, is sort of from the conformal field theory perspective, why such a formula should be true. It's related to the fact that we're studying a theory where the stress tensor is a Sugawara stress tensor. In any case, from this formula, what you can do is then imagine integrating over moduli space. And then you use the fact that when you integrate over moduli space, a total derivative, then as long as things fall off sufficiently quickly at the boundary, the integral of a total derivative vanishes. And in the present case, as long as d is bigger than two, uh, everything falls off sufficiently quickly at the boundary that this argument goes through. And what we find is that our partition function is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian acting on the moduli space of uh, conformal structures on the torus. And at the Eisenstein series that I wrote down, there's also an eigenfunction with the same eigenvalue. And you can also check that it obeys the same boundary conditions. And uh, from this, along with modular invariance, the equality that we wrote down on the previous slide follows. Okay? So this is a sort of a, a, a quick way, maybe a more physics-inspired way of understanding where this Siegel-Bale formula comes from. No, it's perfect. I mean, these are mass forms. Yes. The one, so yeah, I mean, the Siegel-Bale formula is for that, but I want to understand this. So what was the condition? Uh, you said that if d is bigger than one, the function d is bigger than two. Two, yeah, and then the function decays fast enough so that you can uh, compute. So if d is less than or equal to two, then this Eisenstein series diverges and this argument fails. So that's actually something that um, if we have time, we'll come back to. So in particular, you could just look at the sum that I've written over here. And you can see that you can forget about, uh, for the purposes of convergence, you can ignore for a second the condition that the integers c and d are co-prime. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that only when d is bigger than two uh, does the sum converge. Okay? And that's the same condition uh, that appears, um, uh, it turns out, um, for this argument that I made on the next slide to go through. Uh -huh. Alex, Alex, may I ask a 
uh, technical question. The Laplacian uh, on this moduli space, is it possible to express it in terms of the metric GMN and the B-field yep. BMN? Yes, or yes. Uh, for the interest, for the sake of, of, of time, I, I, I didn't write it down explicitly, but one can write it down completely explicitly. Yeah. I mean, just to ask, it's just the usual Laplacian with respect to the Zamologikov metric that you wrote before, is that right? Well, I wrote down the metric. I didn't write down the Laplacian for you. It's in the paper. I wrote it, it's, it's in the paper. We, I, I Given a metric, one can construct a Laplacian in the usual way. I gave you a metric. You could write down the Laplace but yeah. from an operator. I just haven't bothered to do so. Good. Oh, Great. Alex? Yes. Uh, from this partition function, is it? I mean, from this average over the partition function, is it clear that this result is not a, a unitary conformal field theory? Well, it's an average of many conformal field theories. And um, indeed, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, this is an average of many unitary theories rather than an individual unitary theory. Uh, yes, I mean, but t but but if taking taking this this final result, and it, assuming that you don't know, assuming that you don't know this is an average, assuming you you only know that this is a partition function, and then I don't think first it is moduli invariant. But but is, is this clear that this this is not the partition function for a conformal field theory? It must be the partition function of an individual conformal field theory. You could you could check that by. Yeah. A partition function for a conformal field theory would have a Q expansion with yeah. positive integer coefficients. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 yeah. This is not the partition function of a conformal field theory. Um, rather, it is in the same way that, yeah, this is not the partition function of a conformal field theory. I just would request that if you uh, speak up, which you're very much encouraged to, uh, either identify yourself or have your video on or both. Okay. Thank you. I recognize most of these. I know most of these people. It's fine. Okay, good. Okay, so we've carried out this exercise for the torus partition function, which computes the spectrum. But it turns out um, that the story that I've told you is really remarkably general. It works not just for the torus partition function of the theory, but rather for the partition function of the theory on any Riemann surface of arbitrary genus. And indeed, it even works if the surface is not connected. So for example, you could take, as we will uh, later on in this talk if I have time, uh, the partition function you could take on a pair of disconnected tori, okay? compute the average value of the square of the torus partition function. And from that, extract, say, the variance of, in the spectrum. Or you could compute the genus two partition function or some other more uh, highfalutin uh, observable in this conformal field theory. And almost everything that I've said so far goes through in complete generality. So again, the average value of the partition function on an arbitrary surface. Here, now we're averaging over moduli space and regarding it as a function of your surface. And now, instead of depending on the tau parameter of the torus, it depends on the period matrix of your Riemann surface. And as a function of that period matrix, the answer that you get when you do this average is a product of two terms. So the first is a one loop determinant. But this is now the one loop determinant on your fancy higher genus Riemann surface rather than on a torus. So it's not something that has such a simple expression, but it's still something that one can study. So you have a one loop determinant. And then you have the thing that arises when you average the appropriate theta function, okay? which is again an Eisenstein series. It's now not an Eisenstein series for SL2Z, but rather an Eisenstein series for a symplectic group, sp2g, comma z. Okay. So here I'm imagining in this formula down here that our period matrix is a g by g matrix. 
as it would be for a genus G Riemann surface. And then our Eisenstein series is the sum over the 2G dimensional symplectic group, which is a group of 2G by 2G matrices that we typically write in two by two block form where A, B, C, and D are G by G matrices that have integer entries and obey uh, the condition that they sit inside the symplectic group. And then we have a corresponding Eisenstein series that goes under various names in the literature. I think most commonly it's, it's referred to as a Siegel-Eisenstein series. And again, uh, it takes a sum not over the modular group SL2Z, but the higher genus version of the modular group, which is SP2G comma Z. Good. So I won't comment very much on the derivation of this equation, except that one can actually derive it much along the lines of the derivation I gave previously, except that the Laplacian that one studies now is not a Laplacian on the upper half plane, but a Laplacian on the Siegel upper half space, which is the space of, um, of complex matrices. Um, that is to say, it is the space of possible period matrices. But I, I won't go through that derivation uh, in any detail, just in the interest of, uh, of not trying to write down too many formulas. The upshot, however, is that we now have an expression for the average value of essentially the most general possible observable in a conformal field theory averaged over this modulized space. And our job then is now to give it a gravity interpretation. I apologize that it looks like I'll be going over time, but um, I don't want to rush because I, it seems like there are many questions. Yes. So I'll start my video because it was requested. Um, so there's a slight uh, issue here. Um, so now you average uh, this special uh, Siegel-Eisenstein series over the moduli space uh, AG, basically the Siegel upper half space. Yes. Uh, no, no. I, mod I average over the Narain uh, moduli space, as usual. Oh, the average is still over the Narain moduli Absolutely. space. Absolutely. Absolutely. The period matrix lives in upper half space. Not that, okay, 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 okay. So the problem is that not every point in HG is the period matrix. It, yes, so absolutely. Not every point in Siegel upper half space is the period matrix of a Riemann surface. Right. But it turns out that the theta function that we need to average is a function only of the period matrix that makes sense everywhere in Siegel upper half space. I see. That's an important, that's an, so for example, that's why this works for Riemann surfaces that are not connected. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because uh, one can interpret such Riemann surfaces as having a period matrix, but not one that's the period matrix of a, Riemann, of a connected Riemann surface. Oh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Oh, this is Hiroshi Ogri from Turkey. Uh, so can you comment on convergence in the case of a higher genus? You mentioned- I, I, I have a whole slide devoted to it if we get there. Oh, okay, so I'll wait. Good, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question, very good question. Yeah, great. Okay, um, so I apologize. I guess there have been a lot of questions for which I do not apologize, but uh, nevertheless, I, I'm, can, I'm Canadian, so I have to apologize for the fact that I'm gonna go over time anyway, even though it's not my fault. Um, good. So our goal then is to try and interpret this in terms of a theory of gravity. So the first thing that I want to observe is that we're studying a highly symmetric theory. This theory has a U1 to the 2D global symmetry, which in the bulk gravity description should correspond to a U1 to the 2D gauge symmetry. So naturally, the simplest thing that you would imagine writing is a U1 to the 2D Trent-Simons theory. Okay. And indeed, such a Trent-Simons theory, so here I've written it in terms of D pairs of U1 gauge fields A and B with a Trent-Simons coupling A wedge DB. And this is D copies of a U parity of a U1 times U1 Trent-Simons theory that uh, would lead to a U1 to the 2D current algebra in terms of the boundary theory, which is exactly what one would expect um, because 
our uh, boundary theory had a U1 to the 2D current algebra. So this is, I think, a rather um, you know, clear uh, guess for what our bulk theory should look like. Now, because our boundary theory had a stress tensor that sat inside the U1 current algebra, in particular, there was a Suguara stress tensor, we're not going to add a separate Einstein-Hilbert action. We're not going to add a separate Einstein-Hilbert term. Instead, we're going to study U1 to the 2D Trent-Simons theory as, in a sense, a theory of gravity, or at least as part of a theory of gravity. In particular, I would like to view the U1 to the 2D Trent-Simons theory as the perturbative part of our bulk gravitational theory. Now, there's a sense in which this is something, uh, you know, my use of the phrase perturbative part is a little bit confusing. And the reason is that uh, D here is the central charge, which is essentially one over H bar in the semi-classical expansion of our bulk theory. So we're talking about a theory that has a very large number of perturbative fields of order one over H bar per per perturbative fields. And so what that means is that there's no real distinction between classical effects and loop effects in the theory because the number of perturbative fields goes like one over H bar. So when I talk about the perturbative expansion of the theory, um, you know, one has to be a little careful with those words, but we can remember that U1 Trent Simons theory is a non-interacting theory. Okay? It's just a free theory. So we can just go ahead and compute it. So in particular, what I would like to start with is imagining the simplest possible bulk geometry that I could find, whose boundary is a particular Riemann surface sigma. So my goal here is to find a bulk theory that reproduces that Siegel-Weil formula. Okay? So what we want is to reproduce our Siegel-Weil formula, which I remind you was one over some one loop determinant to some power times an appropriate Eisenstein series. Good. So to begin, let's just imagine that we're looking at a contribution from a bulk whose boundary is the Riemann surface, sigma. And the simplest possible saddle point that we could write down is a handle body. So what is a handle body? It's just the geometry that you get when you embed your Riemann surface in flat three-dimensional space and look at the inside of that embedding. Okay? So in particular, a handle body is defined by um, a choice of some set of cycles in a Riemann surface sigma that we declare to be contractible. So in the present case, it's these cycles that I've drawn in purple that are contractible in our bulk manifold Y. Okay? And let's go ahead and compute the contribution from these 2D U1 Trent-Simons field fluctuating around the zero connection on this three manifold one. Okay. So every handle body is a quotient of three dimensional hyperbolic space. So the computation of, so this Trent-Simons theory is a free theory, meaning that all you need to compute is a one loop determinant, right? The perturbative partition function is given by a one loop determinant. Uh, the handle body is a quotient. So it's a straightforward procedure to go ahead and compute that one loop determinant. I won't go through the details. I'll just tell you the answer. So here I've just written down the answer for a pair of U1 Trent-Simons fields rather than D U1 Trent-Simons fields. You have a one loop determinant. So here we have the determinant of the kinetic operator for the Trent-Simons field. Then we have some contributions for the ghosts. It has a specific uh, form that I've written over here that in the interests of time, I won't go into too much detail to describe. But the point is that you can rewrite it purely in terms of the period matrix of the boundary Riemann surface. And what do you get? You get the determinant of the period, the imaginary part of the period matrix, divided by the determinant of a scalar field Laplacian on the surface sigma. Okay. What is that? 
that is exactly one of the terms that appeared in the Siegel veil formula. In particular, we have this one loop determinant coming from the free bosons that live on the boundary. And then we have the determinant of the imaginary part of the period matrix. So our conclusion is that we can reproduce one of the terms in this uh, Siegel veil uh, expression for the average partition function from simple U1 to the 2D Schoen-Simons theory. In particular, one of the things I'll note is that we didn't require an Einstein-Hilbert term in order to do this. So terms involving the renormalized volume of our bulk three manifold would traditionally come from an Einstein-Hilbert term. In the present case, they just come from uh, the Chern-Simons theory. One can think about these as being Einstein-Hilbert-like Einstein terms that are effectively induced by the Chern-Simons theory at one loop. I like, to call, I like to think of them as uh, one loop contributions to the bulk cosmological constant coming from this Chern-Simons theory. Okay. So Chern-Simons theory, as I've said, should be used to describe the fluctuations around a saddle point. But in any theory of gravity, uh, we would expect there also to be a sum over geometries. And in particular, uh, what one typically looks for is a sum over top topologies. And that's what this Eisenstein series is doing for us. So in particular, I wrote this Eisenstein series as a sum over the modular group, sp2g comma z. And I would like to interpret it as a sum over classical saddle points weighted by e to the minus one over h bar times a classical action. In order to understand this, we need to understand how to think about the sum over the symplectic group sp2g comma z that is appearing in this Eisenstein series. But it turns out that this has a very simple interpretation. So in particular, I told you that a handle body that fills in a Riemann surface sigma is labeled by a choice of cycles in my surface sigma that are contractible in the bulk. If you act with an sp2gz transformation on your boundary surface sigma, or I should say on the period matrix of your boundary surface, what does that do? That permutes around all of the various different cycles in the boundary. And it turns out that the sum over sp2g comma z can be interpreted exactly as a sum over these handle bodies that fill in the surface sigma. And in particular, the choice of sp2gz matrix can be thought of just as a choice of uh, which cycles in the boundary are going to be contractible in the bulk. So the result is that this formula for the average partition function has a really um, quite precise interpretation in terms of a bulk theory of gravity. There's a sum over topologies, which in this case is a sum over the handle bodies that fill in our boundary surface, along with a set of perturbative corrections, which are easy to compute because our theory is basically a free theory, at least at the level of perturbation theory, it's a free theory. Oh, There's so one question yeah. about the perturbative part. I should have asked this on the previous slide before you said these wonderful things here. Um, what's, what do you do with zero modes? Do you just delete them or do you assign them some volume or what do you do? So it turns out that there's no zero modes to worry about in the case where the boundary is connected. Okay. Uh, in the case where the boundary is disconnected, there are zero modes which turn out to be rather problematic. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, I actually was planning on talking about them a little bit later. I don't know if okay. I'll get a chance to talk about it. I'll just say that for the handle body case, uh, the zero modes 
uh, are nothing to worry about. For the disconnected Riemann, for the disconnected boundary case, um, uh, one way of dealing with the zero modes uh, would be to uh, really take the interpretation of U1 Trent-Simons theory seriously, where you would have to, multi to replace a zero coming from the zero mode or a divergence coming from uh, uh, the zero modes uh, with the volume of the gauge group, uh, which would be finite. Okay. But there are some problems with that interpretation, as I may or may not have time to get to. I think I'm, I'm desperately short on time. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have negative time, so I may not get to it. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Great. Okay. So what is the upshot? The upshot is that our theory of gravity includes a sum over handle bodies. Okay. And um, the statement that a theory of gravity in three dimensions should be thought of as a sum over geometries, a sum over handle bodies, really goes back, um, I think, almost 20 years at this point to the so-called black hole fairy tale. Okay. So the black hole fairy tale was an attempt to obtain a modular invariant answer from a gravitational path integral by summing over SL2z. So SL2z is the modular group for uh, g equals one, so for a torus. And in this case, the sum that we're doing is the sum over all solid donuts that fill in a boundary torus. And there's an SL2Z's worth of them because you have to choose which of the boundary cycles are contractible in the bulk. Now, in the case of the uh, torus, one can actually show that the only locally ADS solutions whose boundaries are equal to a torus are precisely these handle bodies. It turns out that at a genus bigger than one, this is no longer the case. Okay. And I see things seem to have frozen because on my computer, I, oh, there we go. Okay. It just is delaying a little bit. It turns out that when G is bigger than one, there are locally ADS solutions that are not handle bodies. And uh, these simply appear to be absent in the theory of gravity that we are constructing in order to be dual to the average over an arrayed moduli space. In particular, the bulk theory, as we have described it, at least when the boundary is connected, uh, appears to only include a sum over handle bodies and not include any of the non-handle bodies. So it may be that um, our exotic theory of gravity is uh, simply uh, not smart enough uh, to know the difference between a handle body and a non-handle body. Or it may be that for some other reason, the uh, integral over the space of metrics that appears in this, or I sh that appears in this uh, three-dimensional theory of gravity, simply uh, does not pick up contributions from the non-handle bodies for one reason or another. Perhaps it may be that the theory of gravity that we are discussing uh, does not probe the topology of the bulk geometry in as refined a way as we usually do when we study topology. And it simply can't tell the difference between a handle body and a non-handle body. I think all of those are possibilities. So um, I am over time uh, uh, for which I'll apologize again. So let me just end with a couple of comments. Um, so uh, the first comment is to get back to a question that Hiroshi asked um, earlier, uh, which is uh, about the convergence of that Eisenstein series. So when we studied the torus partition function, we found that in order to get the series to converge, we had to take the number of bosons D to be bigger than two. It turns out that if you wanna study the genus G version of the partition function, you need to take the number of free bosons to be bigger than G plus one. So in particular, you see that if you were to fix D, the number of bosons, and take the genus to be very large, this Eisenstein series diverges. I won't prove to you the divergence of the Eisenstein series, but it's something that one 
uh, can study. And so the result of this is that the theory that we have constructed, it has an interpretation as a sum over geometries, but that sum over geometries diverges when gen the genus is large compared to the central charge. So uh, may I ask you to clarify one point? So for sufficiently small g, you have the identity. Identity yeah. have left hand side and right hand side. So when g becomes large, do both sides diverge in the same way? You know, I haven't thought about the structure of the divergence uh, in enough detail to really say anything about that. Okay. So I, I don't think uh, that's an interesting question, but uh, yeah. So um, in particular, um, what we see is that I remind you that this parameter D was from the bulk point of view, one over H bar. So if we were to just think about a semi-classical limit where D is taken large before working at large genus, then such a divergence would be invisible. Okay. This is really um, some statement about um, the uh, size of quantum effects in this theory of gravity. Okay from a uh, sort of a conformal field theory point of view, the statement is that when we look at this Narain moduli space of conformal field theories, if you were to compute a low genus partition function, then the typical CFT lives in the interior of the Narain moduli space. But if you were to study a higher genus partition function, then the typical CFT lives out at the boundary of this moduli space. And then the bulk, this is reflected in a divergence in the sum over geometries. Now, we could then uh, speculate about what the interpretation of this divergence is. One possibility is that our theory of gravity simply is not smart enough to compute very refined observables like uh, large G partition functions and that it can only compute relatively coarse observables. Remember, the uh, low genus partition functions are low moments of OPE coefficients, whereas the high genus partition functions are higher moments of OPE coefficients. Perhaps the correct interpretation is that the higher moments of these OPE coefficients should not be viewed as independent random variables at large D. So for example, if you were studying a D by D matrix, you know, the first D moments of a probability distribution on the space of matrices uh, would be independent, but the very high moments would be determined in terms of the lower moments. One possibility is that uh, this indicates that our theory only makes sense in a large D limit. Another possibility is that there might be some other sorts of non-perturbative effects. Perhaps we could call them doubly non-perturbative since I've already included the sum over geometries that would be necessary to render the theory sensible. A final comment is that, as I noted earlier, our Siegel-Weil formulas, uh, Vail formulas, sorry, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, very embarrassing. These formulas apply even if the boundary is disconnected. In that case, it would not be appropriate to think of the sum that is appearing in that Eisenstein series as a sum over handle bodies, right? because there are no handle bodies. A handle body, by definition, has a boundary that is a single connected surface. Instead, you would think of this sum more generally as a sum over a uh, what in our paper we called a sum over primitive lattices. And such lattices can be associated with connected geometries that connect two different boundaries. In particular, the expectation value of the partition function on a disconnected Riemann surface. Okay. So this is otherwise known as the expectation value of a product of partition functions is once you perform the average over moduli space, not equal to the product of expectation values. I mean, this is just the statement that we have some non-trivial probability distribution. In the present case, if we were to try and give a geometric interpretation to this, a gravitational interpretation to this, this would be interpreted as coming from connected geometries that connect two different boundaries 
with two different Riemann surfaces. And one can go ahead and analyze the sorts of contributions that you get. Uh, you find that the uh, connected correlator between these two different geometries is small compared to the disconnected correlator, but it is non-zero. And in, indeed, we even in our paper went and analyzed one of these contributions and found a contribution that looks like what we call the plateau when we study the spectral form factor um, built out of the uh, expectation value of the square of a partition function. The gravity interpretation of this is in fact a little subtle. Um, this comes back to a question that was asked earlier, I think by Christian, um, about zero modes, because it turns out that there is some ambiguity as to how one deals with the zero modes that occur precisely in this disconnected case. So I see, unfortunately, that I've gone well over time. Um, so I'll just end uh, with some confusions, uh, I should say, rather than conclusions. Uh, so what we've seen is that it's possible to average over a family of conformal field theories and obtain an answer that looks something like uh, what one would expect from a theory of gravity, where uh, with some assumptions, we can find all of the analogs of the classical saddle points and compute all of the uh, corresponding loop corrections around such saddle points. But many other interesting questions remain, um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Any more questions for Alex? Sorry for going over time. May I ask, yeah, a, may I ask a question? Uh, hi, Alex. This is Tolle. Uh, so you, you started talking about this. I just want to clarify uh, the question, the difference between uh, average CFT and, and one particular CFT. If I consider <clears throat> a random lattice, it will be uh, in many ways um, very similar to the average CFT. Yes. But uh, it might be only exponentially different at the right. level of observables. But uh, the partition function of disconnected regions would be would factorize. Exactly. So right. my question is the following. Uh, is it possible to try to go on the gravity side and try to modify gravity theory such that you will achieve factorization and that would presumably give you a way to construct gravity, which is dual to a unitary safety on the boundary. Right. Unfortunately, that's a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to find gravity theories that do not have uh, g contributions that appear to connect two different boundaries. So for example, there's a, you know, a great paper of Maldacena and Maus uh, from, maybe it was 2004, 2005, um, which enumerated many different circumstances under which such so-called Euclidean wormholes appear uh, that connect disconnected uh, boundaries in Euclidean signature. Uh, and so I think, of course, uh, what we would be very interested in if we wanted to construct a theory of gravity that really had a single quantum mechanical dual is uh, some you know, explanation for why such contributions vanish. But in this average theory, for example, one of the other comments that I might make is that um, if you compute just the connected piece, this is uh, sort of non-zero, but it's exponentially small compared to the disconnected piece. Sorry, I'm running out of room here. And that's more or less what you would expect from a Euclidean wormhole of this sort. So for example, um, that would mean that this contribution is much less than just the naive contribution that you get where you have a pair of handle bodies. And I think it's a general statement yeah, the, by the way, the disconnected geometries are very closely related to the so-called non-handle bodies. Um, in fact, my favorite way of constructing a non-handle body is just by uh, first constructing a disconnected geometry and then quotienting. Um, in this context, the standard idea of Arakorma was to consider eigenstate of 
baby universe creation operator. Right? Does that would that make sense in this context? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Let me. I'll need to think about that. Hi, Alex. I wanted to ask you a question about this uh, spectral form factor thing. Um, does it make sense to consider the U1 to the C churn Simons theory on that topology? And is the answer that you get related in some way to the answer that you get from actually doing the average over moduli space? Yeah, so um, there's an argument that I went through earlier where from any given saddle point, where was it? You can get an answer that looks like the contra. So you can compute the U1 churn Simons theory path integral on a manifold of some topology, and then compare it to uh, the corresponding term uh, in the sum over geometries. And if you do this for the disconnected geometry, so you can do this for the disconnected geometry that looks like this, for example, and it almost works, except there's a zero mode, which leads to a divergence. And uh, even in the U1 case? In the U1 case, yeah. So in, in the U1 case, um, what happens is that that zero mode gets regulated because you replace it by a volume. So you get a divergence coming of one over a zero. Uh, it gets regulated and it becomes the volume of a gauge group. And so you get a finite answer. Okay. Um, so that might be one possible resolution to this. But that finite answer isn't the same answer that you get from the explicit average over moduli oh. space? Um, oh, it, oh, it is the, it is, yeah. Uh, up. So what are you unhappy about? Why, why is that? Well, there's also a sense in which, um, you know, U1 churn simons theory as opposed to, say, non-compact U1 churn simons theory is a trivial theory. Um, in the sense that it doesn't depend on the bulk on the on the bulk at all. So for that reason, I think you know if you want something that really depends on the well, choice, it depends on the topological properties of the bulk, right? Because you get a different answer for this geometry than for just two it's copies. Actually, I think it does depend on the topo topological properties. I would have thought this was exactly what you wanted. I, I it's close. I, yeah, we can discuss it more, but yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's an there's a related yeah. How should I say this? One way of understanding the problem is that if you actually compute this quantity that I didn't explain here, you actually find that it diverges um, because what we have here is a product over all of the non-contractible cycle, a product over all the non-contractible cycles in the bulk, so a product over the fundamental group. And uh, it turns out that when you have a disconnected uh, geometry, that product actually diverges. So there may be, I mean, there may be some, yeah, there, there, there may be something that we're missing, but. Um, Sorry, I haven't. Condensed matter question. Uh, on the on the bulk side, uh, don't you need to supplement your term theory with a with a uh, with a boundary theory, because uh, to have a gauge invariant uh, partition function. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, a, a little bit like in in in, in uh, integer or fractional quantum polytry. Maybe we can. Yeah. Okay. So if you put, we're studying a term Simons theory on a manifold with a boundary. Um, and because of that, as, as you know, there are going to be edge modes. And essentially, that's where these determinants come from, is they come from the edge modes of that, uh, of that churn simons theory. So um, if you like, this is what people, okay, you know, a churn simons theory has no local degrees of freedom. But when you put it on a manifold with a boundary, um, it has sort of, uh, Top a lot, degrees of freedom associated with the boundary uh, that, you know, in this literature sometimes are called boundary photons or boundary gravitons. Or something. Yeah, gotcha. These are, this is, these are coming from there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Alex, I'm a little bit confused about your response to Douglas's question. Okay. If you look at U1 rather than R churn Simon's theory on, say, you know, this very simple I mean, geometry that you've written. Maybe I can, yeah. I mean, it's certainly true that if you just look at the perturbative expansion of U1 to the 2D churn Simon's theory on geometries of this form, you get almost exactly this expression that we've written here. Okay. Right. It formally, seems like formally speak, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, what I was going to say was, I mean, the, the things that are different about the U1, about the compact case and the R case are the finite volume of the zero mode in addition to things that you would call like um, winding sectors. Mm -hmm. Like there's additional saddles where the additional flat connections that you got to well, sum over. But as, as, as always, when we talk about Chern Simon's theory, you know, Chern Simon's theory is sometimes, is usually defined as a sum over flat connections on a particular uh, topological manifold. Mm -hmm. um, in the present case, we're not using Chern Simon's theory in that way. We're looking for a bulk theory that looks like Chern Simon's theory expanded perturbatively around a, um, you know, around a particular bulk saddle point. Sure. And from that point of view, the Chern Simons theory with a compact gauge group seems to be fine. The problem is more that there's a precise sense in which you want Chern Simons theory is trivial uh, in the sense that it, it's really not sensitive to the topology of the bulk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a question uh, related to this thing. I, I'm just trying to understand this formula, the last equality. If you look at the left-hand side, it doesn't depend on um, uh, omega or del naught. It's just, so it's just the product over pi one of y, which is z to the g. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you what q was. Expression. I didn't tell you what q was. Okay. Well, I'm assuming that's e to the two pi i tau. Or I didn't tell you, but uh, I didn't ah, tell you. It's omega, it's e. Okay. <laughs> it, it's a little. It's actually a little more complicated than that. Okay, but it's related to, I mean, it's computed in terms of omega. It's computed in terms of omega, yeah. It's, so when I wrote down, in order to get it to fit on the slide, I lied a little bit when I wrote down this formula. Um, this is really, okay, um, you know, this is really a, uh, a product over all primitive, primitive conjugacy classes um, of, uh, so, you, of, so you, you think of, pi one of y as sitting inside SL2C. And then you think of as, as a sum over all primitive elements or of all primitive conjugacy classes of this fundamental group. And then thinking about an element of the fundamental group as an element of SL2C, mm -hmm. there's, you can define an associated Q parameter, which is e to the two pi i tau where tau is a modular parameter associated with that element of SL2C. Um, so it oh, does depend on the period matrix. Okay, so Q depends on each element in pi 1y. Exactly, so for each element of pi 1y, there is a Q parameter. Um, you know, it has a name, people who study this give it a name, but I forget its name. I just call it the tau parameter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, is there someone speaking? And uh, there's a dog barking in someone's back. That's my dog. Oh, okay. Um, so there are two more. Number one, um, so this gamma naught that you introduced right at the end, which was a subgroup, I guess, of H1 uh, sigma union yeah, sigma. I didn't really have a chance to explain this. Um, so here, um, I, mean, I think of this H1 as Z to some power. So if it was a genus G surface, it would be Z to the 2G. Mm -hmm. And then you think of some, um, you can think of the sum over uh, SP2G comma Z as a sum over um, sublattices sitting inside Z to the 2G. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I prefer, we, it's sort of more convenient to write it this way when thinking about a disconnected surface because 
Previously, I was talking about the sum appearing in this Eisenstein series as a um, sum over handle bodies, but uh, there's no handle body whose boundary is a- You said that this, just by definition, that's not gonna happen, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I've just rewritten, rewritten this uh, summation in a way that is maybe a little more general. I see, so in the simple case- Talk about it as a sum over the symplectic group. This is just, yeah, maybe this was too uh, distracting. I should think about this just as a sum over the symplectic group. Uh, and although I didn't have a chance to talk about it, it's a symplectic group modded out by some appropriate parabolic subgroup. I see. And okay. sigma and sigma prime have same genus. Um, uh, they could, they don't need to. They don't need to. So here G, uh, is the genus of sigma plus the genus of sigma prime. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Um, just a last comment. So the real analytic Eisenstein series is, in, in, even in the classical case of SL2, it's a it's a function in two variables tau and s. S mm -hmm. is I mean usually yeah. modular functions are just in tau, but real analytic Eisenstein series are special because they're in tau and s, and they satisfy certain functional equations in s. So good. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You're, okay. That was that was my question. Your s is d over two y. It's very special somehow. Um. That's a good. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a straightforward answer to your question, which is that when we, I mean, it really goes back to the fact that um, this one loop determinant, I wrote down an expression here. This is one over some Dedekind data function. You yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Which has some modular weight, okay, which is, Basically, um, you know, half. yeah, you might call it modular weight one half comma one half, okay, because it's got a left and right moving one half. Okay. Okay. And so when you go to D of these, you get D over two, D over two. That's where that D over two comes from. Now, it may be, so in the computation that we're doing, that's why that particular value of S appears. Uh, Surely there are other interesting contexts where other values of S appear. Um, it may be that a differential equation, so, so yeah, I don't have any, you know, any, any real further comment except that it may be that the structure that you're talking about is useful. I, let me give you one example, actually. Um, so as you know, um, uh, these Eisenstein series are analytic functions of S, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so one resolution to this puzzle that Hiroshi was asking about, where was that? Okay. So the divergence that we're talking about is a divergence in this Eisenstein series that occurs when the genus is too large or alternatively when D is too small. Right. But as you pointed out, this D is a parameter that uh, one can uh, analytically continue. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that all of these Eisenstein series can be analytically continued in the complex S plane. Yes. So the Eisenstein series, as I defined it in terms of a sum over SP 2G comma Z, that's this condition that I've written here is the condition that the sum converges. But you could always, uh, work from the region where the sum converges and then analytically continue to a region where it doesn't converge. Right, right, right. It's an analog of zeta function regularly. Absolutely. I mean, there's a functional equation in S basically. Absolutely, yes. So there's a functional equation in S which defines this Eisenstein series as a meromorphic function in the entire S plane. Mm -hmm. um, I, and so one could try and define our theory of gravity 
using this analytic continuation. This is very in the spirit of other zeta function regularizations yeah, yeah, yeah. that appear mm -hmm. in some other geometries in 3D gravity. Right. So it's a huge deal to find this functional equation for the Eisenstein series. So there, this is certainly not something that, that we did, but there are papers in the literature that have done this. So this uh, often goes under the name of the real analytic uh, Siegel-Eisenstein series. Right. Um, you know, I think it might have been Siegel uh, who first pointed out that um, it could be, it obeyed some functional equation. Uh, well, in the Taurus case, so in G equals to one case, this real analytic series was introduced by Kronecker. Mm -hmm. okay. real analytic Eisenstein series. And I think the, I, I know the name of uh, Bernstein is usually associated with metamorphic continuation of Eisenstein series, but yeah. anyways, that's like. So what I don't know is whether one should take seriously this analytic continuation. In yeah, no, I mean, if one can use it, that's... I mean, from a mathematics point of view, it's certainly uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, from a physics point of view, I mean, essentially what we have here is a divergence in a sum over instantons. Um, and we're talking about a zeta function regularization of a divergence in a sum over instantons. Mm -hmm. May I ask a somewhat related question to this um, Eisenstein uh, series, which is not holomorphic. Um, can we analyze, I assume there is no Taylor expansion in terms of Q and Q bar, but there is some continuous spectrum. Correct. Uh, can we analyze it and uh, similar to the uh, conventional case, try to, exp try to deduce what kind of states in the bulk saturate the partition function? Is it black holes or something like that? Oh, uh, maybe, oh, there's one very interesting thing I can say um, that was not in our paper, but that was in the other paper that came out the same day um, uh, by uh, uh, Afkami Jetty, uh, Cohn, Hartman, and Tajdini. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct, um, which I think at least partly answers your question, um, which is that if you look at the typical CFT, uh, in this moduli space. And you look at the dimension of the lightest uh, non-vacuum primary operator. And here I mean primary with respect to the U1 to the D current algebra, not Virazoro primary, but current algebra primary. Um, it turns out that its dimension is of order the central charge. Okay. Uh, and this is very, very different from uh, what we would, exp you know, what we're used to thinking about uh, when you think about conformal field theories in the large central charge limit. Um, because typically uh, it's very, very difficult to construct conformal field theories um, with a large gap in the spectrum. You know, typical conformal field theories tend to have lots and lots of light operators. Uh, and indeed, um, the lightest BTC black hole has dimension C over 12. Okay. Um, you know, whether 12 is close to 2 pi E is a question for, you know, uh, someone with a calculator. But, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, the fact that the typical conformal field theory in this family um, has a lightest operator that is, you know, actually pretty heavy, you know, it, it has a, he you know, it's of order, uh, the, you know, of order the mass of the lightest BTZ black hole. You know, I think that may give us a hint as to how we should be thinking about such theories from a gravitational point of view. Um, I don't have anything terribly insightful to say there. In fact, 2 pi e is not very close to 12. It's it's more like 17 or 18 or something like that. Um, so you said this is not the conventional primary. This is primary with respect yeah, this to... Is, this is, this is, so delta one is the dimension of the lightest uh, U1 to the 2D current algebra primary. So it's like lightest vertex operator. 
yeah, yeah. It's the light, you know, so in the lattice, uh, you know, uh, thinking about these as a bunch of free bosons on a lattice, um, you know, this is some... This is the length of the shortest uh, vector in yeah. the corresponding lattice. Right. right. Okay, thanks. Any quick questions? <laughs> maybe, and I don't think it's quick, but they, so maybe I can just ask later if people want to leave. It's just a little, I mean, you gave a beautiful explanation of uh, how to relate the Eisenstein series with the, um, as a sum over um, handlebars. That's very geometric, and I just wanted to uh, understand that better. So the way one thinks of the SP2GZ action, it's essentially you choose A and B cycles on your Riemann surface of genus G. Mm -hmm. And uh, this gives you a vector space of dimension 2G. Exactly. Which is defined over Z, actually. Mm -hmm. and there's an intersection pairing and it's a symplectic thing and blah, blah, blah. So the, yeah, so it, actually that's important that it has a symplectic pairing and it has two Lagrangian subspaces. Exactly given by A and B cycles. Right. So you could think of sort of A zero as defining one Lagrangian subspace. And then you could ask, um, so how does SP 2G comma Z act on this? So it takes, so let me give myself some space down here. So an SP 2G matrix takes I remember it just acts by multiplication and it, you know it depends on exactly how one defines things um, but it basically acts by multiplication on uh, this um, uh, yeah. it's you know, somehow that, that kind of a relation uh, like uh, C tau plus D yeah um, yeah, so the, 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 this, the period matrix transforms under, you know, so the period matrix goes to, um, let me rewrite that a little bit more nicely. The period matrix transforms like this, um, but you could also just look at the action on the associated, um, uh, so, Lattice uh, on the associated 2G dimensional vector. Right. Yeah. Okay, I think, yeah, that's okay. Okay, so you basically just take uh, the vector B to be zero and look at the action on A. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And, and just maybe to help clarify, um, if you look at, for example, you know, this is preserved by a subgroup in SL2Z, which is exact, or SP2GZ, which is exactly that parabolic subgroup. I see. Yeah. So that's one way of thinking about this. The, the parabolic subgroup where all the entries of D are zero, basically. Yeah, um, it depends on, you know, I think in our paper, we might have taken the parabolic sub, you know, we switched our A's and B's, so we <laughs> took the parabolic subgroup to look like this. No, I see, I see. Okay, but, but it's, uh, yeah, the way that I was writing it here, it would be, as you say, the matrix B, uh, B would be zero, and not C. Just different conventions, I suppose. I see. Okay, so that's uh, really nice. That's why this thing, I mean, that's why the Eisenstein series is some of, uh, is some over uh, handle bodies because exactly. the parabolic subgroups act trivially on the Lagrangian exactly. subgroup. Exactly. They're Dane, they're Dane twists. Right, yeah, along these B cycles. Yeah, yeah. Speaking That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, let us thank Alex again. Okay, thank you.